Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mo Bendari, Editor-in-Chief of Ortho Evidence, and welcome to another uh, OE World Tour. We are now coming to you virtually from Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, with a, a close colleague, friend, and in many ways, uh, a mentor to both Dr. Petra Zornai, who will be co-panelists, uh, Paul Moroz. Now, before we start, uh, I would just remind you that the these events, as you know, are deliberately small groups. So thank you for coming and joining, and we'll ask you to stay muted and off video during the presentation, uh, but we'll invite you to come back on video for a discussion. A discussion, as you can imagine here, is one of apt importance. Surgeons doing global health, and I think broadly, we can uh, think beyond surgeons as any practitioner uh, interested in global health for those of you who are interested in this type of um, activity. And how do we manage it? And what have we been doing during the pandemic? Um, Thank you very much, Paul, again, for joining us. And uh, we look Thanks, forward Bo. to your uh, discussion and your uh, presentation. Great to be here. Aloha, everyone. Yeah, um, my title uh, for the webinar on the OE advertisement said Canadian Surgeons Doing Global Health. But really, it's for, as most said, any surgeon anywhere. But uh, I was um, focusing on, uh, you know, our training in Canadian residents and things like that. So uh, that's what the title said. But it's for all surgeons, clearly. And so uh, Mo, uh, you wrote a paper recently on Aisha's um, writing about the impact of COVID-19 lockdowns in the developing world, a humanitarian crisis. Uh, this focused a lot on poverty, food security, gender inequality, domestic violence, things like this, uh, huge, huge impacts. But of course, it also affects surgery. And if we look at the Human Development Index map, uh, we're all familiar with um, uh, the least developed, the most developed, can be translated also into surgical resources, the surgery have-nots and the surgery uh, haves. So um, we all know that surgery has uh, been shown in the literature to be wanting in the real world. Um, a third of the wor uh, world's poorest get only three and a half or four percent of all the surgical resources, while the world's richest third get more than 75 percent. Um, we started getting data from the Global Burden of Disease Study work in the 1990s, but uh, they always needed more surgical data. And so uh, that has been forthcoming. And uh, I think there's pretty good information now on the cost effectiveness of surgery um, um, versus other um, modes of treatment in the low and middle income countries. For example, I think orthopedic surgery has been shown um, in uh, dollars per dolly averted to be at least as effective as um, uh, antiretroviral therapy and HIV in terms of a cost-effectiveness uh, uh, diversion of DALIs. So uh, this has been shown. Mo's uh, great work uh, uh, in Enormous has also been monumental, and I've been very happy to be involved in that. Uh, Mo and Clary Foot and others uh, helped find all these um, um, re recruitment of, uh, of orthopedic trauma centers and in smaller hospitals in India. I helped with my contacts in Africa, and uh, it's been a, 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 a over 40,000 recruits now in getting awesome data um, to help um, um, show through multi-center prospective cohort studies uh, now that musculoskeletal trauma is a huge problem everywhere in the world. And, and I, I, what I love about the enormous study is the um, uh, contrast between public and private hospitals, something that we always talk about when we're working with our colleagues in the developing world, but we don't have the data, and that's the data they need in order to take it to their, their, um, their, uh, their major stakeholders and decision makers to free up resources for them to be able to treat all the MSK trauma that happens in the world. Um, uh, Panthea's recent paper with, uh, with you uh, Mo from the enormous um, work on the delays in the Lancet was monumental, in particular about open fractures, which I have a huge passion for because of the uh, worldwide mismanagement of uh, of open fractures. Just has to just has to change, and 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 change has come. The Lancet Commission recommendations, one of the bellwether procedures that define a true district hospital, uh, now says that everyone everyone in the world should have available to them within two hours. Um, a surgical um, procedure for an abdominal laparotomy, a cesarean section or perinatal surgery, or an open fracture. And the open fracture management has been shown to be such an effect on, on morbidity and, and, and long-term outcomes that uh, it's so important. So that's been huge work. And I've been proud to be part of that. 
in an enormous home. And I think Canadian surgeons have got a long legacy of, uh, or a long heritage of surgical aid in developing countries. Norman Bethune was the reason I got into medicine and surgery. I read his book, Scalpel and the Sword, when I was in high school. And in my grade 10 biology class dissecting cats, uh, I thought this is to be kind of cool, you know, to, you know, travel the world, helping people doing surgery. And so Norman Bethune was a big influence in my, in my personal life and, and, as, and, and many others I know. And there are here a list of other Canadian surgeons, Mercer Rang, a big hero of mine, Ed Blair, an ordinary orthopedic surgeon from St. Catharines, Ontario, who Chris Labby from Oxford will tell you, he has revamped the care of rural orthopedics in Malawi for generations simply by starting a program of teaching non-surgeons, not even doctors, but nurses, how to do 80% of what orthopedic surgeons can do. And, uh, and I've been happy to be involved with, uh, uh, with a number of other Canadians. She's a bunch of Canadian surgeons at a COSEXA meeting in, uh, in, um, in East Africa. We were in 2012, we were external examiners for their, for their COSEXA fellowship exams in surgery. And so there's a bunch of uh, uh, general surgeons and, and orthopedic surgeons. So we've been uh, still getting involved with that. And uh, uh, now it's still happening even now in the COVID era. And you can see on the picture on the right, you know, Mozambique is kind of getting it right with some, some social distancing there when they're meetings, but maybe Burundi and Tanzania are not so, but they'll get, they'll get it, it'll, it'll come along. So, um, and there are many other new up and coming um, Andrew Howard, well, he's not up and coming, but he's been help working in East Africa for many years. Andrew Fury's great work in, in Haiti. Mo, your work. Uh, Megan Cashin and Andrea's in, 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 uh, in uh, Haiti. Fabio has been going to East Africa as an examiner. Supri is an up and coming star. So Canada has been very, very um, a long heritage of this. And, and this is, again, not just a uh, uh, us fancy academic types doing stuff, but even ordinary guys that's in the Okanagan uh, doing uh, uh, um, work with uh, Zambia in, uh, on, on, you know, in a quiet fashion, unbeknownst to all of us at meetings and stuff, but doing quiet, important work. Um, UBC taking people to Uganda, um, um, surgeons from all sorts and residents as well. And Team Broken Earth with Andrew, except now Andrew's uh, left to be premier of Newfoundland, which is pretty cool. He can work advocacy that way for us. So, and then COEGS has started uh, in 2014, thanks to Baz Masri's work and others to help uh, COA um, uh, uh, mandate or not mandate, but uh, promote uh, global surgery for all uh, uh, Canadian surgeons, um, residents, uh, and uh, to, to, to not just in low and middle income countries, but for disaster relief. Uh, working for MSF, Canadian Forces, and also even, um, you know, working in the urban Canada for with street kids or uh, refugees new to Canada who, uh, or in Nunavut, uh, where I used to do clinics uh, through the University of Ottawa. So, uh, uh, but then of course, you all know I bailed from Canada, but not because, uh, because of the work there, it was because the Shriners Hospital recruited me to come out to Hawaii because of my um, advocacy work and work in those uh, um, low and middle income countries because uh, we do a huge amount of work in the Pacific and this little map is kind of cool where it shows Hawaii and then a lot of Melanesia, Micronesia and Polynesia where we actually go off and do clinics. Here's a little map of the same area and all of these purple stars represent a place that we go for clinics um, and then we bring kids back to, uh, to Honolulu for major surgery or we'll do minor surgery in some of these places. I'm off to Saipan in a couple of weeks to do some work. And we'll be there for a couple of weeks with the team to, to look for kids who need orthopedic surgery. So here's, a, here's an example, Ebai is in the Marshall Islands, fifth densest, hosp fifth densest island in the world. And, uh, and uh, you know, the same sort of thing we see anywhere, um, um, anywhere in the world, a nice juicy grade three open fracture um, from, uh, but just, but, but just really mismanaged, you know, uh, um, sort of sutured together because the uh, local surgeons don't have the capacity. And so we're, we're glad to help. That's why we're going there. And so uh, unfortunately they missed his uh, degloving injury to his left knee, which had a, you know, a knee full of gravel, um, which we uh, washed out and uh, thankfully uh, avoided infection. So um, even in the Pacific, uh, it's just like in Africa or in Asia, in Nepal, Bhutan, where I've worked before, um, uh, still big problems. And so um, 
but then the coronavirus, uh, now the Pacific Islands have been, uh, you know, largely spared, many of the islands have been spared from, uh, from COVID largely because it's been closed up. It's been closed up. The cancel culture, a lot of people like to talk about it. And so um, we've been completely closed off. And this Saipan trip of mine coming up is the first one in the last six months that we've been allowed to do. And so we've been thinking about what else can we do? I mean, this Saipan trip still might get canceled in the end. You know, we're trying to do the logistics, you know, a COVID test for me and my team before, five days after we come or five hours after we come, what's the best protocol to do? You know, how would I feel if I bring COVID to Marshall? I, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's not good. So um, the impact is having a big um, of COVID on uh, in the developing world and surgery is, is a major thing because a lot of these things, a lot of these surgical cases are not getting done. The surgical help we're able trying to do. And there's a big interest still amongst our residents uh, on, uh, on working in developing countries. And this is a paper we wrote in 2012 surveying all, uh, all the orthopedic residents and general surgery residents in Canada. And we showed a very strong interest, but there were lots of barriers for them to get involved, the usual barriers. So although 32% of residents had done some kind of volunteering before they started their residency, after residency, only about 5% were able to get involved. What were their barriers? Lack of financial support, lack of organized opportunities, stuff that co-eggs have tried to help. Interestingly, the majority of residents largely had altruistic reasons primarily. And I say that because there are some other surveys out there in the literature. This is one from the American College of Surgeons. Um, and this is uh, actually quite heavily published too. And it's kind of a funny study because, you know, our our work, our, our survey, we had about a 35% uh, response rate, which is about pretty typical for an email type survey. These guys had about an 82.5, which I, in one center, all the general surgery residents at NYU, uh, all 63 of them, well, that probably means a chief resident going around threatening them all to fill in the, uh, uh, this in and get it in because, uh, but it, what's most interesting is what their response is for their number one reason for going. To, uh, to a developing country. And it was 94% of them were interested in technical and clinical skills. And this is an important thing for us to know because we have to beware the surgical trainees who are seeking procedural logbook uh, um, uh, cases to, uh, in order to uh, um, uh, get privileges at certain hospitals. They have to have a certain number of cases. So off they go to the developing role where they can do as many cases that they can get under their belt. So uh, there's a bit of a problem. So I bring this a survey up uh, as a bit of an aside, but an important one, because, you know, uh, medical liability and humanitarian missions is not going away, and it's probably going to increase over time. And it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, I mean, this is a, a talk in and of itself sometime, uh, Mohit, on this webinar, because, you know, when I go to, uh, to Bhutan and I do a, um, you know, a scoliosis case that, and what happens, what happens to me if I, make, if I paralyze that kid? What, what do I owe that kid? What do I owe his family? What do I owe their Have I done them any good? I mean, you know, uh, so these are, these are important issues that we need to be involved in. But now everything's been sort of on hold. Um, international aid groups have to rethink their operations, limit travel, and that includes us as well. Um, so what do we do? There's new barriers afoot for us as traveling and also residents traveling, medical students. What are the travel restrictions? Uh, what are the airport politics going to be? Uh, what about notes? I mean, uh, Mohit, I can, you're going to carry around a note signed by Paul Moreau saying, you know, you've got a medical, you know, I don't know. I mean, am I going to be, my system will be teeming with Tylenol because, you know, I don't want to go to an airport with a fever. I mean, how many times have I traveled with a fever in the past? I have, and I think all of us have. But um, what about a faulty little gizmo out there? And now you've got a fever, and well, you know, now you're st now you can't go home. Like, and where are you going to where Where are you going to quarantine? And what if you're actually sick? Uh, what if Ebay doesn't have a ventilator? Not a single one, I don't think. So, what happens to us? What happens to our colleagues, our residents who are under our our guidance. Travel insurance will increase. Uh, <coughs> this um, one pay, uh, article from the Global Mail, travel insurers excluding uh, um, um, folks uh, with illnesses related to coronavirus. So what do we do with that? Um, what about repatriation insurance costs? Uh, you know, uh, quarantining in a low and middle income country or returning work uh, returning to work at home. Am I going to be gone now for a month instead of two weeks or six weeks or so uh, big issues that we have to deal with. So 
What will surgeons and trainees do now? Well, programs are less likely to let residents and med students go. Mo, uh, I, I want to hear from you and Brad and, and others in the audience about what the, the uh, uh, um, leaders of medical schools, the deans, I mean, uh, are they going to um, uh, let residents go? I mean, it'd be easy enough. I mean, that what, they'll probably get a legal, they'll probably get a legal uh, opinion. And you know what those guys do? Like, so, okay, zero, zero travel for residents. We don't want the liability. Um, so, uh, you know, things like that. Pre-departure yeah, training. I, I, I totally agree, Paul. I mean, I think the challenge we're having here right now, and I, I won't, I won't uh, you know, derail your discussion because you're moving forward here, but you're absolutely right. The challenge we're going to face is, uh, is issues of liability and also quarantine, right? International travel right now in Canada is very, it's very limited. So we're not, you can travel in Canada, but getting out of Canada, there is some quarantine issues, especially in the higher, um, you know, places where COVID is still surging. Yeah, yeah. What about pre-departure training? Should that become mandatory? Well, I think it should because we do have an ethical imperative. I think if we're actually promoting surgeons and residents to travel overseas, then uh, then we ought to, we're, we're kind of negligent if we don't help prepare them. So uh, I've been involved in a lot of uh, pre-departure training in the past at the University of Ottawa and now here at the University of Hawaii. And I gave a talk about thoughts about risk for people when they go overseas. And we usually, I mean, everybody thinks, oh, I've got to get my shots. I got to watch out for SARS. I got to watch for Ebola, HIV. Uh, I don't want to catch Ebola. Uh, well, now it's COVID, but in reality, Mo, what's the single most biggest threat to a resident traveling in a developing country? Or you, in fact? You tell me. Oh, well, what, what, what Probably you going to get a hit by a car, Mo. Or oh, you're gonna, no. you're I hope gonna, not. I hope or, Brad, or Brad's going to decide to to rent a motorcycle in Haiti because he wants to go joyriding. And so, uh, traumatic injury, I mean, Enormous has shown this and everything's showing this that it's the number one killer in, in young folks and residents age and things like that. So even if you included HIV, malaria, measles, COVID, TB all together, still uh, the number one killer. And, and, and that's clearly shown in the leading causes of death. You know, this is in high income countries and in low and middle income countries, it's road traffic injuries and is, is, a, is a big killer. And you know what, it's, uh, you know, and this is what keeps us orthopods busy everywhere you go in the world is that it's okay. It's not the dead people. It's the 50 million. It's the dead or the tip of the iceberg uh, of the pyramid. It's the five serious injuries that happen for each death. So the 50 million that are injured that keep us and our colleagues putting in IM rods at all, you know, uh, at all hours of the day and night. And in the low and middle income countries are 90% of all road traffic crashes. So, and so that's what the big safety things for our residents, but clearly now COVID's a threat. So when I was giving these talks, you know, I'd always tell the residents, okay, guys, you know, I mean, it's your, you know, you're in a new place. You don't, you know, do you drive a motorcycle in Hamilton? No. Uh, should you really drive one here now or in Dar es Salaam? You know, I know it sounds inviting or, you know, use a reliable taxi or I used to pay taxis more to drive more slowly because they're speeding like maniacs. And so, and always promoted people to know their own blood type and know a, a good friend's blood type too, who's, who's there because you might get into trouble, you might need their blood. So, but again, uh, everything's now on hold because of travel in the time of coronavirus. So what, what's happening? Uh, what else can we do? Uh, well, uh, uh, tele Teleheal is a United Kingdom NGO now, which is doing a lot of telehealth, right? Everybody's saying now telehealth is going to save the, save the day. And so these guys are exchanging ideas and, you know, uh, Lon London, England radiologists are reading these scans in Kabul, Afghanistan to help these guys in their tough ICU cases. And so that's, that's a possibility. Saving lives in Afghanistan over the phone. Is that our, is that our new future, Mo? Um, and so, I mean, we use telehealth an awful lot here. We're doing telehealth all over the Pacific in one way or another. It's been very helpful, but, uh, but telehealth won't save the day if you need surgical procedures to be done and there's already a shortage of surgeons in, in low and middle income countries. Well, we all know that telehealth's increased about what, 11,000% in, in the US. You know, I'm distressed to see that the biggest articles in all the orthopedic uh, journals seems to be concerned mostly about re the re remuneration of telehealth versus anything else. And then the, the people selling the technology, we have no, because we're involved with telehealth in the Pacific, we have had good, you know, oodles of companies coming to us. Oh, you know, we can sell you this and this and that. Let's, let's apply for a grant for this. But, 
And then, and then the technologies between the haves and the, and the tech have-nots. The, the most vulnerable countries have the poorest bandwidth and the poorest capacity, and they're the ones we really want to reach out to, but everyone's getting overwhelmed by the telehealth things. And, and again, surgical examination, surgical procedures are still clearly difficult to do uh, well, over telehealth. So what are other opportunities? Well, we evaluate our mandates, whatever that means, how to better interact with our colleagues, what are some new opportunities? So Mo, uh, Brad, you know, what should university programs anticipate? Uh, how are we gonna react to this? Are we all just gonna wait it out, which I think probably will be it, and, and then hope that in the post-vaccine era, I'm personally worried programs are gonna get axed because now uh, leaderships are seeing, okay, well, you know, uh, maybe we'll just ax this program because it doesn't fit our bottom line. And that's personally what I'm worried about in my current organization here, that they're going to pull a few programs because uh, they, you know, it's happened through because of COVID. And so, so how can we advocate for this? Uh, so advocacy is a big issue for me now that I'm getting older and creakier and these big spine operations are getting harder to do. So uh, I was a big fan, always a big fan of Mercer Rang. Uh, Mercer Rang is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and sick kids. Mercer Rang always said that uh, an MPH probably has done more to reduce surgical morbidity and mortality than any surgeon doing an operation or developing a plate. Why? because it's the MPHs of the world who have developed better roads and guardrails, better resuscitation seat, seat belts, airbags, speed limit legislation that has largely prevented or mitigated surgical injury. So advocacy is very important. Promoting the WHO, warts and all, universal health coverage is a big issue that I'm personally going to be involved in more and more over time. Of course, we're dealing with situations like this where, um, you know, uh, the biggest uh, contributor to the WHO has pulled their funding during a major pandemic. Um, this is the kind of stuff we have to deal with. Um, worldwide universal health coverage is important for us in the surgical world because one of the things that the Lancet Commission in Surgery has shown is that millions of people face catastrophic health expenditures due to payments for surgery and anesthesia each year. And unfortunately, it's happening even in the United States. Uh, to my shock, moving here um, from Canada, where, you know, uh, personal uh, bankruptcy, you know, probably 50% of personal bankruptcies in the United States are secondary to medical bills. And, um, but this is a huge problem in the low and middle income countries where catastrophic health expenditures because of surgery is a big problem. So that's where I'm going to be um, working in the near future uh, while I'm sitting here in Honolulu and, uh, and so the impact of COVID-19 lockdowns in the developing world, a surgical crisis like no other, I think. And so uh, um, that's, that's, so I need your help guys. What do we do now? Wonderful. Well, let's, let's, <laughs> why don't we get uh, some folks back on, on the screen here? Um, those of you, if you can just come on screen. Thanks so much. Aisha, your paper is getting called out a lot. So that's good stuff. People are reading it. It's good wonderful. job, good job. It's a small group of us. So this is the last bit. Um, and I know mostly everyone here has uh, either an interest in academics related to understanding this problem uh, or have actually traveled uh, and done some stuff. Let me first, if I could, begin, uh, if I can, Paul, maybe I'll raise the question you asked. And I'll raise it maybe with Brad right now. And I see Franca here as well. Um, how can we, in a time where you really can't travel, um, be effective um, or be at least seemingly as effective as we were before. And Brad, I wonder if you could speak maybe a little bit about some of your recent activities um, that, have, you know, that have still been able to show some degree of um, effort uh, and support of other nations in need. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Mo. Thanks, Paul. That was just really, uh, really great and, and interesting stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it's changed everything and we can't travel, but um, we were, um, reasonably successful uh, recently in getting some supplies off to Beirut um, as part of the disaster stuff. And as everybody knows, I mean, I think international work can take different flavors, education or going to do work or, or disaster relief. And um, we were, we, we managed to mobilize some, you know, medical supplies here and, and uh, create some ties in the community as well as um, uh, some ties with global logistics people to, get some stuff over to help. Um, but man, it was, a, it was a major learning experience. It was um, pretty eye-opening to see how 
difficult it can be to get stuff into a place, um, even though you know they need the stuff um, from all levels. So uh, that was one thing um, you know we were able to do. But it was it was um, it was a pretty massive coordination effort. To be honest, Paul, it's easier. Uh, just to pack a couple 50 pound bags and get on a plane and go. But um, well, honestly, Brad, in my experience, uh, I probably lost as many bags uh, through one way or another that uh, as have come through. But I mean, mm -hmm. if some of it doesn't get through, but some does, then Chris Lobby at Oxford is very interested in this whole supply chain issue of orthopedic yes. implants and things like that. I think we've talked about that in the past, yeah. but uh, you know what, uh, maybe that's got to be re-looked at again for disaster relief, but also, you know, how can we help with just equipment supplies? And well, and I, oh, I think that's a huge point as well. And, and especially since a lot of patients are uh, um, paying for implants in different places. And uh, <clears throat> so but getting, getting well-known supplies and using people that we know, like when we travel to India and, and meet some company people and trying to, trying to make those links uh, with the surgeons, like for instance, in Uganda, you know, when I was at the meeting, I would say, okay, well, let's, who, which company are you using? And let's narrow it down to two. And yeah, they've got some money and, you know, J and J wants to come in as, I think there's lots of ties that can be made like that. Yeah. But I think our Canadian mindset has to change a little bit because there's this concept of, Oh, you know, we're, we, everything has to be free. And, and in, and in reality in the world, it's not. So I think we have to, have a little mindset change as well with this implant stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you, can anyone here speak to this issue of, um, you know, really thinking carefully about what somebody needs in a situation of a crisis rather than what we perceive they need. So there seems to be this desire to say, Oh, there's a crisis. Let's get on a plane. Let's go there and let's all show up and do everything we can because us physically being there will somehow solve some of these issues. And for me, particularly, you know, in this, in the tragedy of, of the Beirut explosion, it was very clear that um, it wasn't healthcare personnel they needed. And in fact, had you just had that COVID prevented us, but maybe it had COVID not been there, there would have been again, the same sort of surge of individuals, well-meaning going without really understanding what is the actual need. And I wonder if you can speak to that when we're thinking about these broader issues of helping. Uh well, I want to give Paul a chance to respond, I guess. It, it's a big topic. Uh, I, I can see both sides. You know, when, when uh, you know, uh, I, it, it made me think about a tsunami in Samoa here in 2009 when, uh, you know, uh, 200 people died and, uh, and they really had no surgical capacity from a manpower point of view. It's sort of kind of the opposite of what you're, what you're saying, Mo. So uh, big issues. I mean, I... I, I knew I knew that in uh, in uh, Lebanon in in you know th they have a lot of doctors there they have a lot of lot of great talent I mean a lot of residents you know fellows so we've trained end up going back and so I knew it wasn't a manpower thing I, it was a it was a supply issue you know and so uh, and it made me think about Chris Lavi's supply chain issues in East Africa and so I think uh, you know I've I've done the company bit the J and J bit in East Africa in the past. That's not so easy because it's legal departments, it's things like that, and that's frustrating. Uh, it seems to be personal contacts, and uh, but even that can't, you know, sometimes is thwarted. So I don't know what the. Uh, so how did you? So Brad, uh, step by step, wh where did you send stuff to Lebanon? From where to where to where? And can you can you illustrate? Um, well, it was interesting. We got. Um, I had a contact in Rotary. And, okay, so Brad, Brad, uh, would, before we go, yeah. I mean, do you mind just giving a little pricey about sort of basic timeline? So I think most everyone here is aware that there was the tragic explosion um, in Lebanon. And, you know, from, from the rough date of the explosion, um, how quickly then were you engaged? I, th I think it was on the day of that I contacted you and then uh, you well, mobilized really within 24 hours, it seemed. Well, you spoke to, you know, Dr. Fatty the next day, I think, and, and it was right after that, wasn't it the next day? Right after Correct. that, we, uh, yeah. we made a call to um, uh, a Rotarian that had reached out to us about six months ago, um, and he had uh, contacts with a medical supply warehouse in Stratford. So I, I basically just called him and said, uh, what have you got in the supply warehouse? And then uh, he all of a sudden mobilized 
a whole bunch of things. Rotary was amazing, quite honestly. He said, okay, we're going to set up a charitable uh, donation on our website. And I said that we would match the funds raised from McMaster. And then they put in a global Rotary grant, grant to match those funds. So we had a three to one raise almost immediately in terms of money. And, this, and so then I drove down to the medical supply warehouse that weekend to see what they had, who then put me in touch with another medical supply warehouse in St. Catharines, for heaven's sakes, who says, yeah, we've got a ton of stuff. They drove and put me in touch with a group called Not Just Tourists, is a, a doctor and his wife in St. Catharines who basically put medications and things together. So if you're going anywhere in the world, they'll put a 50 pound bag for you together and you take it and drop it off somewhere. Anyway, these places are in our backyard. So all of a sudden, all of a sudden we've got them on the line. And now there's another rotary guy in Cornwall who's got a 40 foot container with a bunch of beds and mattresses. All of a sudden we've got all this stuff and we've got a bit of money and we had a receiving party on the end. And, uh, but I didn't know how to get it there. So Dina Baquet is, uh, works for Global Logistics Management. She's a shipping company container person. And, mm. and she developed a campaign called Lebanon Strong because she's of Lebanese descent. And so as soon as we had that shipping link, we were done. That was it. We had Rotarians on, on this side. We had and on the other side. We had Rotarians, Beirut Cedars on the other side. We were asking Good. them, what do you want and what do you need? We had Kerry Tass who offered to be a broker for us to accept the equipment. And within a week and a half, we had three full pallets worth of stuff that we air shipped over. But it was interesting because COVID um, slowed down the air shipment. And to be honest, three pallets by air was three to $4,000. Um, and so it flew to uh, Egypt, sat there for a few days, and then flew to Beirut. But here's the really interesting thing. It sat there for three and a half weeks in Beirut before mm -hmm. the government released it mm -hmm. and finally released it. But I'll, I'll be honest with you, and I, I think we're only a few numbers here. It took a little bit of talk. It took a little bit of money um, to get it out of there. Yeah. And then yeah. if anything at all was outdated, it was a big, big problem. So we were very, very clear from the start that we were only sending in dated material. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple of little things slipped through, I got to admit. Um, uh, but uh, so it was very important, only in dated material. And we asked, what do you want and what do you need from the other end? We had um, uh, three groups accepting on our behalf. And I personally spoke to the president of each group and the customs broker and said, this is what's coming in and can you do this for us? Mm -hmm. I even called the, uh, the government of Canada and, and got through to the humanitarian office there. Um, and he was very nice. He was, and he helped me, um, but he said, we don't advise you do this and we're not giving you any help, <laughs> essentially. And I can understand, right? You can't just have any group so, just sending stuff, but it was- So Brad, yeah. so, so Brad on a, on a, okay, so, so you, all this activity was happening. It was happening like, like over a very short period of time. You were able very quickly to get to raise money and you were able very quickly to raise enthusiasm. So much so there was media associated with, there was a lot of activity yeah. and then it happened. And then there was this period of lull, right? There was a period of weeks where nothing happened. And I, and I, I must say, when you reflect back on it, there seems to be this urgency of everyone's talking about a particular issue. It, news cycle changes and then it's gone. Yet, yeah. yet, you know, w when you communicate still with the, the docs in Beirut, they still were in dire need of support. Yeah. But the news cycle had moved on. And I, I wonder, uh, just generally, you know, maybe not just about Beirut, but about many, many other crises that have happened around the world. These, these cycles happen, uh, but maintaining um, effort seems yeah. to happen and you know things happen really quickly when it's a hot topic area where there's national level interest or interest around the world how do you then maintain that energy how do you continue to do things when the rest of the quote news has moved on because this is never about the news cycle right this is about actually trying to do something meaningful and i know yeah. you've all had experience in this so i'm curious how you've managed to continue move forward and i and i still remember you telling me stories about haiti for example um, Brad, both you and yeah. Paul. I'm curious. 
I'll tell you, Brad, I think that, you know, um, and, and I've only become a Rotarian since coming to Hawaii. And uh, I'm pretty impressed with some of the work the Rot Rotary Club can do. And, yeah. you know, you mentioned a couple of important topics, the Canadian government and their multilateral, bilateral relationship with Lebanon or whatever, or any other country, probably not going to help you a lot, but it's good to try and get their blessing anyway. Yeah. But uh, Rotary Club is kind of an interesting place. And when I go to Saipan, one of the first things I'm going to look at is the local Rotarian Club, because most of the movers and shakers in a in, uh, in like you found in Lebanon are Rotarians because it's yeah. a worldwide organization. They want to do a lot of good work. Um, we don't have to rely on, we're, we're used to relying university to university and, uh, and stuff like that. But uh, I think the Rotary Club might be your, your connection because it's ongoing. They have global grants. Um, they've got people on the ground. Uh, you mastered the, 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 the major point. It was that, that shipping contact we had. Yeah. Uh, but um, I think the Rotarian Club, uh, Rotary Club, is uh, very maybe a key element in your in your you know continuing to uh, uh, and and this is not only in in Lebanon. I mean, uh, Rotary Club. I mean, um, Rotary Clubs. You know, where I grew up being familiar with because of its work in polio and in pediatric orthopedics. Right. Rotary Club's well known. At the KCMC in Moshi, the big hospital there, their huge prosthetics orthotics is all is all Rotary funded. And so um, that's, that's one thing that could help, you know, those kinds of contacts, real world contacts. Because remember, Rotary isn't just university props and docs and stuff like that, academics. It's auto parts salesmen, um, yeah. the guy who owns a bar, who wants to give back. And these guys know how to make things move. So that, that's when you said Rotary, you thought, oh man, he found it. That's, that's, and notice what you said too, St. Catherine, Stratford. You yeah. know, small towns connections. It's amazing. And as I get older and talk to more people in this field, I'm always constantly amazed at those kind of contacts. Yeah. Hey, listen, I want to ask you guys a question, or uh, maybe Brad, I'll let you answer or, or respond to that. But I, one more point I want to make before we leave, because I know time is going. And by the way, I, by the way, none of you answered my questions. So you're both politicians. I asked the same question. <laughs> you've never one answered. One way to keep momentum, Mo. <laughs> is this rotary stuff because okay, got it. Now okay. thank got you money, oh that right? was the answer okay so i didn't now know we, but, I didn't but know. now there's money there's the site there's people <laughs> there's this project and they don't want to see it go down either so to, to your point we've we're putting together our second our second container our third shipment okay, now, now of um uh, of new material um uh for for rehab so the different set and uh, I'll be honest, Disaster Aid Relief Canada is putting uh, a whole bunch of stuff in their Rotarians as well. So I think that's what keeps some of the momentum. So my keen sense suggests to me that Franca Masuda has something she'd like to share with us. Um, she's been doing some of this stuff. Uh, and maybe, maybe you can speak, Franca, to your experience in Uganda, for example. Um, but anyways, I, I'm just curious what you're making of this discussion. Thanks, Mo. Um... <laughs> Can you hear me? Sorry. We can. Yeah. Yeah. All I can offer is from an individual. Um, I know that financial um, issues definitely uh, is a problem when it comes to people wanting to volunteer. Um, but I think we all have an invested interest in wanting to help. It's how we can get that help to the people that we want to help, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. It does. Absolutely. And let me ask this as, a, as just a general statement. There are some here who probably haven't, haven't had a chance to get involved quite in the way that you have been, uh, Paul and, and Brad and Franca. What would you recommend for someone who's been thinking about, well, you know, I wouldn't mind being able to do something, but I just don't know how I can get involved. I see, I see Steve, I see Aisha, I see Yeping, I see Yad kind of nodding. Uh, and I wonder if any of this is resonating with you in terms of, you know, what do we do if you want to get involved? Well, I just have a really quick comment, Mo. Um, so I'm remembering our last OB tour, and we had the two surgeons from Sub-Saharan region who talked about the value of virtual training, right? So I okay. think, Dr. Moroz, as you're speaking about um, this outreach uh, initiatives to train residents to work with people who work from different contexts, I wonder, given COVID, if the next uh, phase of training could be virtual involvement and that still allows people to interact with people from around the world, uh, provide consultations. So that's 
something that I just thought about as you were speaking and giving your presentation. That kind of interaction is a huge, uh, huge impact. I mean, uh, personal relationships that, I mean, I haven't been to Africa for a long time, 20 years. I can't remember the last time now. Anyway, but because I've been going to Asia, now the Pacific, but I still get emails from uh, contacts of mine there saying, Paul, what do I do with this elbow, you know, or something like that. It's just email and back and forth. And, and then to speak to your virtual, you know, so it's personal contacts. Uh, it's also virtual training of uh, residents. You know, we're involved in a residency program in Fiji and Samoa. And, uh, and these are mostly general surgery residents who are learning to do the orthopedics because they're the only ones there. So we're involved with them to try and uh, um, do some teaching. So, uh, so it's an important, you know, it's gonna be a part of our world from now on, you know, yeah. for sure, I think, because it's costly, it's cost effective. You can, you can look like, well, like we're doing, we're all over, all over the world right now. Um, and so it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna ramp up for sure. To answer Mo's question, how to get involved, you know, COEGS, the COA Global Surgery Committee, uh, we, we want to be a broker of organizations to have people, you know, explore, ask questions and get involved. One of my good friends in Owen Sound, where I started my orthopedic career when I first finished training, Jan Henning, uh, you know, he, he's uh, from South Africa, but he came moved to Canada. And, and then now I got him going through this organization called HVO, Health Volunteers Overseas. It's a nice entry level organization. It's already organized. You go for four weeks, it's set up, you've got contacts. Already. So I think it's just talking to people. If you're a physical therapist, for example, go to your Physical Therapy Association of Canada or of the US. They almost for sure have a volunteer international arm to their organization. Almost everybody does. Um, you know, uh, pharmacists, uh, engineers without borders, you know, um, find an organization like that, talk to people, hey, you know, what would be a safe, uh, you know, entry level uh, experience for me to see if I like this kind of thing or, you know, whether it's what I want to do or what are the options that I can get involved in. So I hope that answers your question, but there are a lot of options. Just, uh, you know, internet has really opened things up for searching out things. So, mm -hmm. Anyone have any other questions? I know we're a little bit over, but I think it was important one, to have One question I want to ask you guys is that the COEGS, uh, um, uh, I'm still a member, and we want, to do a, we want to send a survey out to all the program directors for the orthopedic training programs in Canada, asking them about what, you know, uh, about, you know, what are programs allowing their residents to do? And so uh, what, what do you think they're going to say, or what do you think? We, we touched on it a bit, you know, uh, liability issues, personal safety, that kind of, what, what, uh, what kind of questions should we be asking in the COVID-19 era? I think they're going to say they're not going anywhere. We're still doing, you know, Zoom meetings and Zoom rounds in Hamilton, for heaven's sakes. I, I don't think any residents are going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. Um, that's my first initial thought. Um, let me ask, well, let me ask here, like, is there anyone here who sees themselves traveling internationally? in 2020 or even into the middle of 2021 international well, i'm going to saipan in two weeks well, which is about a you. six hour flight from here it's a little it's in the northern marianas north of guam it's it's pretty clear it's a tier zero for COVID, so pretty controlled lots of testing on this side and this side you know it's not me i'm worried about they're worried about me and my team bringing it from hawaii oh, for sure absolutely yeah. so i mean we'll do the appropriate tests it may still get scrapped I've yeah, 50, 50, 50. I, I, I really do believe that in, in, in a non-vaccine environment, it's going to be very difficult for people yeah. to feel the comfort level of traveling. Yeah. yeah. But who knows? I get the sense that it'll be June 2021 before people start thinking about yeah. it personally. I don't Easily. know what you, everybody Easily. else thinks. Yeah. Easily in mid-2021 at the earliest. Yeah. So. Right. Okay. Um, I think, you know, I want to thank you all and certainly thank you, Paul, for taking time to put together a very thoughtful presentation. Uh, thank you all for attending. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Ha Take have care. a good evening. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye.